All right, we are picking up uh, work this afternoon on H273, um, which came to us a while ago. We did have an introduction to this by the sponsor of the bill. It's an act relating to, the pro to promoting racial and social equity in land access in property ownership. Um, it is only related to the previous bill that we heard um, through the fact that it's a it's promoting racial and social equity and land access, and then there's the concept, the concept of property ownership, and there's um, a long list of intent and findings in this bill that are important for us to know about. I'm not sure we can get to them all today, um, but I'm going to pass the microphone to David, who's also just going to let us know how we should be how we can be looking at this language at the beginning of the bill before we get to the bill itself. Um, David. Good afternoon again, everyone. Um, David Hall, Legislative Council. I'm going to pull my screen up if that's okay. Uh, Please do. Yeah. H273, an act relating to promoting racial and social equity and land access and property ownership. Um, I wanted to start uh, up at the beginning with the statement of purpose as introduced because it uh, features you know, a language construct that is used throughout the bill and um, I think helps frame, you know, apropos of our conversation this morning about uh, populations that are targeted for assistance or, uh, you know, engagement in the, these different bills, um, this is a different and more expansive way of approaching, um, you know, the issue framing the population. So this bill, you'll see on line 12, proposes to promote racial and social equity in land access and property ownership by creating grant programs, financial education, and other investment target, investments targeted to Vermonters who have historically suffered from discrimination and who have not had equal access to public or private economic benefits due to race, ethnicity, sex, geography, language preference, immigrant or citizen status, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, or disability status. So um, that is uh, obviously uh, an expansive list of uh, Vermonters who have historically suffered from discrimination and not had equal access to economic benefits. Um, we talked a little bit this morning about, um, you know, some of the, uh, basically about the spectrum of ranging from protections to affirmative benefits based on, you know, different, uh, characterizations or categories of breaking up populations in, from, from the perspective of state action, government action. And, um, you know, there, there is, uh, the, I guess the one thing that I didn't say this morning that I wanted to add to that uh, conversation is that it's not only the letter of the law, uh, but also its implementation where, um, you know, state action can be, could be challenged on the basis of equal protection. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, you can have a law that is facially not, uh, you know, creating any sort of race-based set aside or allocation or preference um, but in effect, or the way that it is administered by the government, if it is, um, you know, if it plays out that way in, in administration and in, in reality, in effect, then you could have the bases for those challenges are the same. The burden on the state to demonstrate its compelling interest is the same. And, um, you know, what I mentioned this morning about the state bearing that burden and having to demonstrate, ha having to meet that uh, burden of proof is, and that being rooted in findings, is an important point 
that I think is informed or at least touches upon, you know, the findings here, there are um, an extensive amount of findings and statements of intent in the bill as it is introduced. Um, you know, whether you agree with the findings, whether you uh, want to refine them or explore them, that is going to be your choice. I mean, a finding is supposed to be that. It is supposed to be ideally, you know, something that you find and want to memorialize for the record that you're building. Um, shall I pause? Representative Kalaki, do you have a question? Thank you, David. Uh, okay, Chair? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, David, I just want to know that in, in the purpose section, Mm -hmm. Is there any, are there any protected classes against discrimination that are not included in this list in any of our state anti-discrimination, like housing discrimination or employment discrimination? Uh, I'll have to look back and double check on that. Um, I, I'm not certain. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I can look it up. It's in, I think, 90 SA 4501. Um, but I, I'd have to cross check those to be, to give you a definitive answer. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and that is, I, I, I mean, that's for public accommodations and fair housing. Yes, um, yes. Okay, so. So, um, with regard to the findings here, as I said, um, you know, very extensive, um, whether you choose as a committee or as a body or as the legislature to make these findings your own is a policy choice for you to make. Um, I wanted to say, um, you know, the development of legislation, and I think you've all been around a while now and know that you all hold a privilege um, with the attorneys in my office. It's an attorney client privilege. There's also a statutory legislative privilege that you hold so that the request for a bill, the process of developing a bill, um, those communications are privileged and protected, and it's not my privilege to waive. It belongs to the, the member, the client who is requesting the work by an attorney. So I, I can't, you know, say too much about the provenance of the findings themselves, other than to say that they, you know, were, obviously were developed in the course of developing this bill and proposing this legislation and the sponsor working, uh, you know, with whomever the sponsor works with is responsible for the bill as introduced, right? Whenever you guys sign off to introduce legislation up until the point it gets released out into the world, it is, it's your baby. Um, and, you know, once it's introduced and referred by the presiding officer of the body it goes to the committee. Now it's your bill. And so, uh, you know, now I work for you, you're all the client and, um, you know, the, everything that, that comes next is going to be your policy choice and what you want to do with that. I'll say that the, uh, and I'm, and this is the, this is the last thing I'm going to say about the uh, findings and intent statements and turn it over to the chair, um, that I, I did have a hand in the editing and the choice to leave in the citations for a lot of the findings. There are primary or secondary sources that are cited in italics, and I thought that it was important and significant to leave those in the text of the bill as introduced so that to the extent people wanted to uh, know where some of this came from, you could go to those sources and um, those don't have to stay in the bill. If you ultimately choose to keep the findings, you don't also have to keep the citations, but they're there for now as part of that record. Um, 
And lastly, uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, the findings and intent are not in always, they're not always consistent with the text of the statute that's proposed, whereas the statement of purpose in the text of the statute pretty consistently refers to Vermonters who have suffered discrimination and unequal access to benefits due to, et cetera. The findings and intent and purpose, some of that language uses terminology that is different. It uses non-white, it uses black, it uses BIPOC, it uses white. Um, um, so, you know, as I said this morning, uh, it's usually good to be consistent across parts of a bill unless there's a good reason not to. So I would, I guess, raise that for your reflection, you know, whether you want all that terminology to be same or not, or if it's going to be different, is there, you know, a good reason for it, et cetera. I think that's enough uh, prefatory commentary from me on findings and intent. Mr. Chair, I turn to you for how to proceed. Um, I'm committee. What is your pleasure on this? I'm because this was um, given the way that David explained this again. He basically, you know, was able to take this information and put it into this form. And in order to give this information, I think the um, the time that it needs. I would like to be able to invite, um, well, talk to the sponsor of the bill and find out who exactly provided this information and who wrote it and give them an opportunity during, um, when we open this bill up for more testimony to come in and explain that. Does that make sense or should we read, you know, the, or the option is to do that or to, to read it through or to, to skim it now Again, I've asked you all to be prepared to read it. I don't. I'm not going to judge you whether you have or not. But um, because of the because of the depth of the information, um, and because it's really the work of of um, individuals or a group, I'm, I'm leaning right now towards towards um, having this coming back to this and letting David just do the 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 bill itself or the bulk of the bill. Does that, John, uh, Representative Kalaki and then Walsh? Well, I, I was about to reach, I, I think what you just said is right. If on page 25 or 19, which it says purpose, I, it seems from there on is really about what the legislative, uh, what would happen in this bill if, if it was moved forward. So that I'd like to know. And I, you know, the findings I did read and we can go into those, but I think for this, just so we understand what this bill would do, what it's redressing. So, uh, okay. I, but I think I'm agreeing with what you had just said. So, thank you. Okay, Representative Walls and then Murphy. I agree too. Uh, I think it's very important to understand the findings and, and, and in that instance, it would be really good to hear from the folks from whom that information came uh, to make sure that we really understand it. So I, I agree with the uh, strategy just outlined that we start with the purpose and move into the bill. Okay, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I don't mean to be offensive and I hope this isn't taken incorrectly, but I, I totally support your, your idea of let's go forward with the purpose section three and on. I, I think that what's in section one and two are very important. Their, their testimony, their rationale, they're what the committee could consider. But I, I am uncomfortable when, when we're writing legislation and we put in that much of prelude um, that isn't statute. It isn't what we are saying, this is what we are changing. So I just offer that and do look forward to hearing uh, from witnesses hearing testimony, but that's how I would see those first 19 pages. Okay, thank you. No, it's, we rarely, um, in this committee, I've not had too many instances, there have been some where we work with findings, but again, this is, this is slightly different. It's important to know um, where, how it gets included in the bill later on, if, if we move forward with the bill, 
is is up to us. But I think I think having it as as the backup for for what the intent is, I think is um, is different than even the findings that we've just put in H one fifty seven. Representative Murphy, I'm sorry, Howard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh... Mr. Chair, I, I concur with my um, committee members. Um, I would like to hear from witnesses as well. Thank you. On this historical section? Yeah. Yes. Okay, we will um, reach out to the sponsor of the bill, the, the primary sponsor of the bill and, um, and find out from him where, um, who we should invite in to take us through this material. Um, thank you, committee. And so David, if we can go to section three, which you just rolled to, um, and then take us through the, the statutory portion of the bill. Sure, <clears throat> happy to do that. Um, so section three purpose, um, so the purpose of the act is to invest in individual and collective land access and property ownership as a way to move towards greater racial and social equity in wealth distribution. And, you know, this, 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 we, we reached this point after the findings discuss the disparities in wealth and property ownership and the nexus between health, wealth, property ownership, access to healthy food and land and opportunity, et cetera. So um, how does the bill itself, what statutory changes does the bill propose to accomplish this purpose? Um, it creates a fund and a board and provides uh, an appropriation. Um, I would say uh, similar to uh, modeled upon in part, if you're familiar with the Working Lands Enterprise Board. Uh, so, you know, that was created many years ago. It's a board of, um, you know, people who are involved with Working Lands Enterprises and um, it has a fund and it has a, a board structure with a diverse group of board members who make decisions about how to uh, allocate those funds that are appropriated to that fund. And um, this is a similar construct. Um, you'll see in section four here, 10 VSA section 12, creating the Vermont Land Access and Opportunity Fund. So there is created a special fund. It's in the state treasury. It has a name. Um, and the reference here to 32 VSA chapter seven, subchapter five, being mindful of, uh, you know, Representative Murphy's good uh, observation this morning that it's good to know what the cross references are. Um, there, there is a provision in title 32, chapter seven, subchapter five, um, that relates to the creation and management of special funds within state government. So obviously we have the general fund, we have, um, transportation fund, we have the education fund, et cetera. There are also a, a significant number of special funds uh, that are state administered and are segregated. Um, there are kind of a lot of inside baseball rules about who at finance and management keeps the you know spreadsheet and cuts the checks and does the warrants and what happens to the interest that it earns and all that jazz. Um, and it also says that when you create a new special fund, you need to do certain things like say who's going to manage it, et cetera. So that's what's going on here. Um, we're saying, you know, as a general rule, this is going to follow the rules that all special funds follow with a few twists in B. Um, one, the Vermont Land Access and Opportunity Board will be the one to administer the fund. That's a common construct. Two, the fund shall comprise monies appropriated to it by the General Assembly and other public or private monies the board accepts. Three, unexpended balances and any earnings shall remain in the fund from year to year. They won't revert anywhere else. They don't go to the general fund. 
and four, the board shall expend monies from the fund consistent with the powers and duties specified in the next section. So if you're familiar with the Working Lands Enterprise Fund, you, you would notice that this functions basically the same way. Um, the next section, 10 VSA 13, creates the board that manages the fund, the Vermont Land Access and Opportunity Board. So A, it's created as a function of statute and for administrative purposes would be attached to ACCD. Fairly typical means they get, you know, uh, sort of ministerial support, administrative support from the agency. Um, under B, the organization, this is where, you know, obviously we specify who is on the board and how they get there and what their, in, in this context, what their constituency is. So one, B1, we have the executive director of racial equity or designee. B2, three members appointed by the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, at least two of whom are Abnaki. B3, two members appointed by the Vermont NAACP. B4, uh, a member appointed by the Vermont J Racial Justice Alliance. Five, a member appointed by Vermont Relief Collective. Six, a member appointed by the Vermont Everytown Project. Seven, a member with financial expertise appointed by the Secretary of Commerce. Eight, a member with real estate expertise appointed by the Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. Nine, a member of farming expertise appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture. 10, a social worker with expertise in anti-racism appointed by the National Association of Social Workers, Vermont chapter. And uh, 11, two members appointed by the Pride Center of Vermont who are LGBTQ. Those are the board members. So C, uh, this is kind of a boilerplate member term priority composition. So a member of the board shall serve a term of three years or until the member's earlier resignation or removal. An appointing authority shall fill a vacancy pursuant to subsection B above. Three, when selecting members of the board, appointing authority shall give priority to and shall seek to appoint a balanced mix of Vermonters who have historically suffered from discrimination, who have not had equal access to public or private economic benefits due to, and it's the same group as above in the statement of purpose. So under D, the board may elect officers, establish committees and subcommittees, adopt procedural rules as necessary and appropriate to performance work. E, quorum voting, a majority of the sitting members constitutes a quorum the board may take action by a majority of the members present and voting at any regular or special meeting in which a quorum is present. And three uh, permits meetings to occur through electronic uh, telecommunications or video or audio conferencing, which um, is hilarious to think was a cutting edge concept added to our statutes, particularly in the authorizing statutes for business organizations 10 years -ish ago, uh, <laughs> and look at us all now. F, compensation, private sector members are entitled to per diem compensation uh, for each day spent in the performance of their duties. The cross references to the standard uh, provision in Title 32 that governs the uh, per diem compensation for special uh, committees, et cetera. I think that's $50 a day plus expensive, but I'd have to double check that. Um, see, powers and duties. So the board shall have the authority and duty to promote racial and social equity and property ownership for Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination, uh, as we've seen, as follows. One, so this is what the board does. The board shall award grants for the purchase of primary residence two grants for the purchase of a farm property or land deemed suitable for regenerative practices, three grants for land access and stewardship programs, four funding to new and existing financial education, wealth management and regenerative natural resource programs led by and focused on Vermonters who have historically suffered from discrimination. Five, the board shall retain wealth, financial, and natural resource advisors who are Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination and not had equal access. And B, 
use the services of those advisors to provide and create education, wealth management, and regenerative natural resource services to grant recipients. Six, the board shall award grants to anti-racist mutual aid networks that support recipients of grants for home ownership and land purchasing. Seven, the board shall award grants to groups proposing to share land to create commons and for collective ownership. Um, eight, the board shall grant funds to the Everytown Project to purchase and hold land in trust in every municipality in Vermont in order to promote land access and stewardship by Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination. Nine, the board shall work with VHFA to explore ways to apply grants to mortgage subsidies and explore ways to overcome the barriers to obtaining a mortgage, including debt to income ratios, redlining, impact of algorithmic systems of decision-making. Under 10, the board shall work with the Vermont Department of Taxes to explore ways to provide tax breaks to properties attached to the grants. I'll just say those last two, you know, usually would be more uh, a session law type directive. You know, it's not necessarily gonna be a permanent you know, list of duties 50 years from now versus these are more immediate work with them and then we'll come up with long-term steps, action items that the board would take. But, you know, just a matter of statutory uh, construction here or how it is constructed. So eligibility, el eligibility in subsection H, the board shall have the authority to adopt rules concerning eligibility criteria for recipients and rules for the use of grant funds, which shall include income guidelines, limits on the amount of grants, and rules governing the transfer of grant funded properties, generational poverty, inheritance, and impact of any other assistance already received. And then two, the board shall allocate grants to achieve a balanced, healthy mix of private ownership and collective ownership. So, um, you know, is a is a matter again of just how this statute is put together. You know, subsection H uh, on the on the spectrum of flexibility and authority delegated to a, an entity. This is pretty broad, right? Um, you know, obviously, whenever you design a program, um, there's usually some mix of statutory guidance and requirements, and then administer, uh, you fill in the details. This is quite broad and, you know, something you uh, may be fine with, may want to flag for further refinement. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it crosses the line over into, um, uh, a violation of the delegation doctrine, uh, which says that, you know, the legislature can't give away its legislative authority to say what the law is. It can delegate for the administration of an implementation of a law once it says what the standards are. Um, so it, because H1 tells them what to include, you know, as far as income guidelines, limits, other rules, you're in better shape than just a carte blanche sort of, you have unfettered discretion in determining whatever you want for how you use this money. There are, I think there's enough parameters for it to be a, a, an acceptable scope of delegation. <laughs> Lastly, section six appropriations. Uh, so this is an FY22 general fund appropriation of $10 million to the Land Access and Opportunity Fund for grants and other expenditures approved by the board. And because this is a, uh, because it has the FY22 appropriation and other things that probably would coincide with the new fiscal year, the whole bill right now is slated to take effect on July 1st of this year. That's it. Um, David, just quickly before I get to other questions, um, the um, we, we've talked a lot about task forces and summer study committees and expenses and 
whatnot, and and the fifty dollars a day plus expenses. When we have um, members of either your time or, um, in this case, the director of of um, racial diversity. I mean, this they serve on their on their salary time, correct? As uh, long as they're state employees. <laughs> Yeah, so that um, that provision that's cross-referenced 32 VSA 1010 basically says you get the $50 per day um, to the extent you're not acting in your capacity as a state employee or other uh, compensated position. Um, okay. So, so if know, someone has a point, a 1.0 in an FTE, we're we're saying that they need to somehow fit in whatever 0 0.2, 0 0.4 that this time might take um, for them to fit it into their existing schedule. Is that right? Or their designee? Yes. Okay. Um, Representative Murphy, then Parsons. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, my first is just I noticed the absence of numerically stating the board membership. It, it lists them and I tallied them up on my fingers and I think I came up with 15, but I it seemed to be an absence that I haven't noticed in other bills and whether that doesn't put a cap on it and leaves it open to be added to. Um, just curious on that point. You can do it either way. Um, sometimes when, uh, you know, you're doing, making a lot of refinements or changes to what the number is or who's there. It just, it, uh, the math can get wonky and not add up as in our bill this morning. And sometimes it's easier to just be silent on the number until you actually know what the final number is. Thank you. So it would be something that we wanted to just put maybe a placeholder or a, sure. a blank, something of a, as a reminder that at some point we'd identify the quantity of, of members. Yes, and you, my, my other question is, is a little bit um, funny, but I realized that in a couple of places, especially on page 24 on line 21, we speak, we use the category of Vermonters. We specify Vermonters who have been affected. And I'm just curious if we ever define a Vermonter because it's a question. <laughs> Are we speaking of someone who is a legal resident of Vermont? Or, I mean, we've run into this with the vaccines in this pandemic. It, you know, is it someone who's moved here and intends to be here? Um, is it someone who's had history and, and the impact was as a Vermonter? Or are they just here now and over their life have been impacted? So I, I think that's probably a, a big question. Sorry, Chair, I kind of opened a big door on that one but I think the definition of Vermonter might be critical for this bill. Okay. Um, again, that's, the, we will flag that and have that conversation. Um, Representative Parsons, then Byron. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just curious of um, the legality of requiring a sexual preference as two members appointed who are of the LGBTQ. Are you, is that an allowable thing? I certainly wouldn't be for it if it said straight male. I can't imagine, is that, is that a legal thing to do requiring a member be chosen based on sexual orientation? Uh, you know, my gut reaction is that it, it's not a legal problem um, because it's not um, it, it's not conferring any benefit or uh, you know setting up a situation where there's discrimination based on a presence or absence of any factor. I mean, it's, it's presence it's, or absence of a factor. Uh, well, I don't know either. You have blue eyes or a person can't be elected if they have blue eyes you know i, I mean either neither way in, in terms of conferring a government benefit or prohibiting some kind of 
activity that would other be otherwise be allowable, for instance, in the Public Accommodations Act. This is a state created board that has, you know, wants to have um, a composition that's reflective of as just like in the Working Lands Board, you know, there's a farmer and a forester. Here we're talking about populations of people who have historically suffered discrimination and then a board created to try to assist them. Um, but the but so it's not going to that benefit or that assistance. It's just going to the board member. So is it a is it a legal problem? No. Is it a policy choice for you to make? Absolutely. So I I guess I just say that it, it, if it stopped after saying a member of the be chosen by a member of the Pride Center of Vermont, that seems totally fine in my book. But it just seems odd that the state would be creating boards and you are or are not allowed to be on that board based on the sexual preference in this. Yeah, I, I hear you. I think it's a it's a policy choice for uh, you guys. I, I also would say that, you know, as to the other constituent groups, um, you know, I, I don't know the extent to which all of these are formal organizations, whether they have a process for you know, how this appointment would work. Um, I, I don't, I, I was under the impression that there are two chapters of the NAACP in Vermont, but I may be wrong about that. So I, I would say on all of these, you would, you would want to do your homework and make sure, um, you know, that these are all organizations that can be recognized and operate to the extent necessary to identify members who you choose. And, and the other thing I would say is I, I think um, I am not the expert on Native American affairs. And I know that for different purposes, how you refer to persons of different uh, ancestry for purposes of federal and state law is very important. So if that in any way becomes an issue for you, you it might be good to talk to Damien about that. Yeah, and I think some of the the proposed um, expenditures or grants are also would would have to be reviewed. We don't the, the appropriations committee tends not to do direct appropriations to nonprofit groups. Unlike the, I mean, they'll do it to VHCB or VHFA and um, organizations like that that are basically NGOs. But um, for instance, we saw in the I believe in H315, where the original plan was to um, appropriate $650,000 or so to VLCT to help municipalities deal with the planning grant money and or, or the, and this incoming money that's coming directly to, uh, to um, municipalities. And they changed that so that it's a grid. So it's essentially a grant that's going, that's going to be given through uh, ACCD or DHCD. But it's going to be, you know, it had to be done on an application form. Um, yeah. Representative Byron. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think I know my uh, my question's answer, but in the appropriations section, so the $10 million, that would be a one-time appropriation. And I assume that the opportunity fund is a revolving loan fund. Is that the intent of this, is to see the money get loaned out? Be recouped, or would we need to replenish this? Should it become exhausted through the grant process? Uh, well, so it's a good question. Um, you know, most of these duties actually call for grants rather than loans. Um, I think you would want to specify that they could be grants or loans or if you want them to be just loans and if you wanted to revolve, I think that you would want to be explicit about how that is structured. Okay. Thank you. And that's a conversation that we'll also have with S79 with that section that the Senate didn't include about, about the first time home buyers and, and where they become grants and where their loans um, but this this is this is grant grant heavy in this draft, and again, this is a proposal from the sponsors of the bill. Um, 
that was trans, you know, basically that that the attorneys worked on to present it to us. Um, any further questions for David right now? It's definitely a different concept of of bills that we've worked on in the past, um, in the recent past. So it's it's um. Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to, I don't think we need to go too, too deep into the weeds on it, but um, I just wanted to make sure we started out just to hear it and um, to get an understanding of what the structure of it is. Representative Murphy. Thank you. I first of all want to thank David for um, following up on my mention this morning about the, the following the law and, and when we, when we cite a section, how, you know, what it says, but I wondered if for the, the new members and just maybe a refresher for all of us, if while we have you, excuse me, I'm out of breath, the stump grinder came and I had to run down and speak to him. <laughs> um, if we could um, have David just use the share screen and show us the ledge page and show us where to find the laws and where to even do a search of them. Um, Cause it really isn't very hard once you're just given a little bit of a map of how to get there. And, and I, if we had five minutes, I think that could be really valuable um, in the future, if not at the moment. Um, I don't know, David, if you want to do a, do a thing one, I mean, sure. the last gasp non-technical way I would do it would be to highlight you know, using my cursor, I highlight the bill and or highlight the reference and Google it with make sure you have VT in there. And chances are you come up to where David's going to take us right now. I'm happy to do that. Um, let me uh, let me share uh, this screen. Um, Make sure I'm only showing the legislative page and not uh, my credit card statement or anything. Nope, just the legislative page. You want to see my email? <laughs> um, so you're seeing the Vermont General Assembly homepage at this point? Great. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you know, anytime you want to go back to this, obviously you just would collect, you click here. Um, if you want to look up the statutes that are referenced in a bill that you're seeing, then you would go to Vermont laws and uh, you could go directly to the statutes online right here. Remember that these statutes are organized by title and then by chapter, then by in some cases subchapter, then sections, subsections and subdivisions. Um, they start, uh, there's 33 titles. We start sort of with the biggest picture, general government, legislative branch, executive branch, judicial branch, and then we're off to the races from there. Um, ag is in six, a lot of the work that I do in uh, my other uh, life, commerce and trade are in eight and nine. You guys, I know, do the uh, title seven stuff sometimes. The VHCB stuff we looked at this morning and sort of uh, development, Act 250, those things are in Title 10. We have a series of business organizations through the 11, that's stuff that I work on. And we move over to judiciary type things, court procedure, crimes, trusts, blah, 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 uh, education. And then we move into government stuff uh, to health, highways, security. You guys do a lot of labor, Title 21. Um, Motor vehicles in 23, uh, zoning subdivisions, that type of uh, regional governments are in Title 24. Um, not a lot in Title 25, honestly. The work you did for the contractors is here in 26. Uh, property, real property is in 27. Ukiowa, something else I staff, relates to housing and common interest communities in 27A. And we've got public institutions and property, kind of government services stuff. Public service title 30 is, you know, like uh, the public service board, telecommunications, those types of things. Here we've got horse racing and gambling, uh, taxes and money is in title 32. And then human services is the newest title, title 33. So whenever you see the, re the reference to 32 VSA, whatever, you would go to the link. And now we have all of title 32, right? 
Um, the chapters are great. The way this is set up online, you can either go find the specific section you want within, or you know, you open the whole chapter up, and you can either uh, again select a particular section of law, or if you go all the way down to the bottom, you can open the entire chapter at once and. You know, if you all are wanting to educate yourself on how a certain kind of statutory scheme is put together, it's really best to read the chapter in its entirety rather than just an independent section of law, because even though each section of law is supposed to be freestanding, it, it, it's always part of a broader scheme. We call that often reading statutes in pari materia. Um, if you want to search, you can either go here or here and use sort of the internal uh, Vermont search system here, or you can go one step further and actually go over to LexisNexis, which we uh, have a contract with so that you can uh, do a Boolean search, a more tailored search um, within our statutes. Uh, if you want to look up bills rather than this, the, the statutory law itself, then that is here. There's a bill act and resolution search, and this is broken down all kinds of ways. You'll also see that along the uh, left sidebar here, you can navigate. Um, you can change sessions. Be careful that you're looking in the right place, because if you do change your session, you will be looking at old bills um, and old acts. It will let you know that by turning orange. Uh, and then when you're done in an older session, you can just return to our current session. Um, you know, your committee pages are all here. An excellent resource uh, for information. How specific stuff, including your calendars, your journals, your rules. Um, are all here, same with the Senate, and of course your streaming links. Joint Fiscal Office maintains its own web page and it's broken up you know, by subject and publication. You can search around there. Um, if you need to find a report that's been given to, submitted to the legislature, then you would do that here. And you'll see a very long list of reports, which you can refine uh, by typing in a keyword, right? Um, and that's about it. If you need to get in touch with one of us or somebody, we have the directory here. And then there's lots of nice pictures of the state house if you wanted to look around so, here. So David. Yes. So in the bill that, that Rep. Bloomley is a co-sponsor of the H-232 yep. that we just heard about earlier today, there is section 2, 10 VSA, subsection 303 is amended to read. How do I find 10 VSA, subsection 303? We go to Vermont laws. We go to statutes online. We would scroll down to title 10. Title 10, okay. Then that's 10, that's the 10 in 10 BSA, Vermont Statutes okay. Annotated. And uh, what was the section again? Uh, 303. All right, so we would scroll down until we find the chapter in which 303 appears. That's chapter 15. This is the creation of the Vermont Housing Conservation Trust Fund. We would open that up and then we could either go again specifically to 303 Right. Or we could open up the whole chapter, whichever, whichever one you prefer. Um, I got so, I got what I needed now. Thank you. Yeah, Perfect. I great. needed that simple version. I'm so I'm so glad to be able to do this. This is great, David. I really appreciate it. I I I think that um, not having been able to be in the house, our all of our freshman class and anyone that was appointed or just didn't get to do a intro course. I don't know how they've done it. I know my first year I got a great ring through with the um, orientation, but it, if you don't get the map, you just feel lost. And, and it's amazing how much information is available to us if someone just gives us that key. And you did a great job giving the key. So thank you. My pleasure.
And, and if we were in the building, I mean, I'm, I'm like the kind of person who would sit, if I needed to look up a word in the dictionary, I'd, I'd get back to my work a half an hour later because I'd go look <laughs> at all the different words as they went along. And, and the statutes are like that too, because they're not only, not only are they put in a linear fashion, but they're all annotated. So they have a history lesson that you can decipher eventually as you're going along too. You can get lost forever um, in them. But this is the, this technology, like I said, allows, allows you to cut and paste and find what you're looking for if we're making those connections um, as, as Representative Murphy, Murphy was pointing out earlier today. So, um, all right, anything else for David right now? All right. Um, then let's be done for the day committee. Um, welcome back, Chip. I'm glad you rushed back for the last two minutes. The, um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll just be on the floor tomorrow morning and then, um, doesn't look like I have anything scheduled after the floor. Did anybody notice a calendar today? I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I don't think that there's a lot, but we have, we have a one o'clock back in committee, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to make these last couple of days a little bit lighter than the first couple of days of the week. Um, we put in our hours this week and, um, we, we do, we are meeting after the floor. No, we are. Uh, hey. We're having an introduction and walk through uh, uh, yes. uh, shipping licenses. Yeah, reciprocity, good times. Yeah, and that's actually, sorry, we are going to work tomorrow morning after the floor. Um, and that's actually going to have a little bit of uh, a Grand Home 101. Uh, so it's a little bit of the alcohol law that's going to talk about, we're going to try to have, have Tucker talk about what it means and what this, what how alcohol uh, spirits beer and wine are sh are able to be shipped because we're going to have these questions people are asking us to be able to ship different things to you know to consumer we keep we keep losing you chair you keep freezing on us i can take it from here you know and, and then do can we cross state lines Um, we, we couldn't hear you. Yeah. That's so there's been, a, the there's been a great deal of interest with the manufacturing sector, especially with COVID, about opening up the um, ability to do direct to consumer shipping. So, this is a short form that was introduced that touches on the subject through um, the eyes of the brewing industry. Um, it's a bigger conversation once you get to spirits. So, this is basically um, an introduction to the, the grander concept through this short form bill. Yeah, so we'll take some time and we'll take some time and get into the, get into some of our, what we can and cannot do at this point in time without there, there is one new bill on the floor tomorrow. It's um, H20, pre-trial risk assessments. So we'll, we'll do third vote on H225 and then one more bill. Okay. All right, so let's be done for today. Thanks, everybody.